Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. If you would please turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 18. Exodus 18 uh, addresses a family reunion of sorts. You will see as we go through the text that Moses had previously sent away his wife Zipporah and their two children, their two boys. And uh, today is the account of them coming back together again. So we're going to talk a little bit about what preempted the, the separation, what caused that, and also about uh, how things were when they came back together, what happened at this family reunion. Will you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? <coughs> Didn't give you long to sit, did I? This is Exodus chapter 18. We'll begin in verse 1. Now Jethro, Reuel, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard all of all that the Lord had done for Moses and for Israel his people, and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Verse 2 says, Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Moses' wife, Zipporah, after he had sent her away from Egypt, along with her two, son, two sons, of whom was named Gershom, stranger, for Moses had said, I had been a stranger in a strange land. The name of the other son was Eliezer, my God is my help, for Moses said, the God of my father was my help, and he rescued me from the sword of Pharaoh. Verse 5, Then Jethro, his father-in-law, came with Moses' sons, and his wife to join Moses in the wilderness where he was camped in the mountain of God, that is, Mount Sinai and Horeb. Verse 8 says, He sent a message to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons who are with her. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down in respect and kissed him. And they asked each other about their well-being and went into the tent. Verse 8 says, Moses told his father-in-law about all the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for the Israel's sake and about all the hardship that had happened during the journey and how the Lord rescued them. Jethro rejoiced over all the good things the Lord had done to Israel and he had rescued them from the hand of the Egyptians. And verse 10 says, Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of Pharaoh and who has rescued the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. Indeed, it is, was proven when they acted insolently toward Israel, and the Lord showed himself infinitely superior to all their gods. Last verse, verse 12 says, Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and other sacrifices to offer to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law before God. Father, we pray that you take these words and that you make them clear to our hearts and minds. And Lord, that you teach us and grow us. But more importantly, Father, that you shape us into your image, that you draw us closer to you than we've ever been before. It's in Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. 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 So this passage, if you look at your uh, horizon, I apologize because we ran short on those. So um, if you need to share uh, or if you see somebody around you that doesn't have one, and you have two or whatever, please uh, please share. You'll see it breaks down into Jethro bringing his uh, family, Jethro having this meeting with Moses, and then Jethro praising Yahweh. Let's start at the beginning. Uh, Jethro brings his family. Look at verse 1, and we'll see the report. It says, Now Jethro, Reuel, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law. Now this is a long description for one guy. For one, from one, for one person, right? They call him Jethro. Jethro is his formal title that means he's a priest. Okay, so that's his official title. Reuel, which in my Bible is in parentheses, you may not see that in yours, but Reuel is his personal name. So uh, on a friendship level or on a personal level, he'd be Reuel. On an official level, he'd be Jethro. 
Okay? He's also referred to as mother-in-law, or the, the father-in-law of Moses. You know, Moses' father-in-law, Moses' father-in-law. That happens eight times in 12 verses. So, for some reason, the writer of Exodus, which is Moses, chose to narrate, or chose to, by under the, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, to make it clear this is a, a, uh, a familial uh, relationship. In other words, he is his uh, father-in-law. Okay? So, now, it says he's a, um, and not here, but in other places, he's a priest of Midian. Now, what that means is he is this, uh, this spiritual leader for the Midianites. Now, what had just happened in Exodus chapter 17 is there was this big battle uh, between the Israelites and the Amalekites. The Israelites defeat the Amalekites. The Amalekites, I'll try not to get you lost in all the ites, the Amalekites and the Midianites were close, closely related. So, um, I don't believe the Midianites wanted to start a war with Israel, because Israel's two million strong at this point, and it's a pretty impressive force. Now, they're not battle-hardened yet, but they're still big in numbers, so they're not wanting to, to itch to start a fight with the Israelites. So, this priest of Midian, now Moses' father-in-law, ends up uh, making this journey to go see Moses. Okay, so let's look at how that came to pass. Says, verse 2 says, Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Moses' wife, Zipporah, after he had sent her away from Egypt. Now, so, where is Zipporah? She's with Dad. Why is she with Dad? Because, remember, take, take your Bible, flip back to Exodus chapter 4. We know that she left with Moses. So if she left with Moses, how'd she end up being back with Dad? At Exodus chapter 4, look at verse 20. Verse 20 says, And Moses took his wife Zipporah and her sons Gershom and Eliezer, and seated them on donkeys, and returned to the land of Egypt. Moses also took the staff of God in his hand. So in Exodus chapter 4, verse 20, you see Moses loading up his family, and making this trek to Egypt. He's, he, he, he had just received this divine call from uh, the Lord at the burning bush. Uh, this fire from, moves from the bush into Moses' heart. He catches fire for God and decides, yes, I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm going to bow and obeisance to the Lord. And I'm going to go serve him. And I'm going to go confront Pharaoh. And that's going to facilitate the release of the Israelites. So he loads up Zipporah and her two boys and takes them with him. So what happened? Anybody know? Something did. Pharaoh probably threatened the lives of other so foreign kids. That's one theory. What Eric said was that, that Pharaoh may have threatened the lives of, of Zipporah and the kids. That's true. If Zipporah and the children made it all the way to Egypt, then they very likely were in some kind of danger because Pharaoh would have went after them. What else? There's one other theory. Yes, ma'am. She was, excuse me, she was required to <coughs> circumcise her two sons in the wilderness, and she was not happy about that. She was not. She was required to circumcise at least one of them. Look at, um, if you're still in Exodus chapter 4, skip down to verse 24. Just so you understand what's happening here. I want you to, it's important for me that you learn, not just so you have some good knowledge of the Bible. I want you to have the knowledge of the Bible, but I want if you understand really where these things are coming from and how all these pieces fit together, you see the majesty of God more clearly than you ever could if there's confusion in your mind. Does that make sense? So that's the reason why we spend so much time training, you know, actually getting you to, 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 to take these concepts, to learn them, and then to actually live them out in your lives. So that's the importance of it. Look at verse 24. This is the event that uh, Ellen just referred to. Uh, this is Exodus 4, 24. Now it happened at the lodging place that the Lord met Moses and sought to kill him, making him deathly ill because he had not circumcised one of his sons. Verse 25 says that Zipporah took a flint knife, cut off the foreskin of her son, and threw it at Moses' feet and said, Indeed, you're a husband of blood to me. <laughs> Verse 26 says, So he let Moses to alone to recover. At that time, Zipporah said, you are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. So, uh, now we'll go back to 
Ephesians, or uh, Exodus uh, 18, sorry. So here's what had happened. So in this trip, Moses had been commanded all the way back, just jot, make, make a note of this, in um, Genesis chapter 17, I think along verse 9 or thereabouts, but Genesis chapter 17, um, Abraham had been commanded to circumcise uh, uh, their children. They, they, they were given this, this clear directive. That circumcision, circumcision united them as an Israelite. It brought them together. That was their covenant. That was their requirement to be circumcised. Well, for whatever reason, the Bible doesn't tell us, and we won't speculate, Moses did not do this to at least one of his children. He has two, Gershom and Eliezer. Gershom means, I was born in a strange land. That's, you know, um, symbolizing his, his time in Midian. And Eliezer means, God is my help, or God, God is my presence, is what Eliezer means, uh, symbolizing the future hope that, uh, that rests in the family. So one of these two boys were not circumcised. And so here comes Moses riding in to face Pharaoh, the most you know, uh, terrifying force on the planet, representing Jehovah God. And as he's representing him, he has not kept the most basic covenant uh, uh, that's required by God. The most basic thing. So this, this, this fire burns up in the Lord and Yahweh, and the Bible says he sought to kill him, which probably means he made Moses deathly sick. By, by some form of means. I mean, he just uh, went after Moses. Now, if he wanted to wipe him out, he could have done that. Okay? He could, in other words, God definitely could have killed Moses if he wanted to. The point is, he didn't want to, or else he would have. All right? So what, what he does at this point is, evidently, there had been some strife between Zipporah and Moses about what to do with this circumcision deal. Uh, Zipporah was a Midianite. She was a pagan. She was raised underneath a, a, a pagan priest, okay, which worshipped all these different gods. So to her, circumcision was, was completely a million miles from her thought process. She didn't understand it. She didn't like it. She didn't like pledging allegiance to one god that seemed uh, simplistic, seemed to be ruling out too many options. She liked uh, uh, worshipping all the, the gods of Midian. So she didn't want to do this, right? So there'd been conflict. Moses saying, we've got to do it. Zipporah saying, we can't do it. Husband and wife ever have disagreements? What about, do you ever have disagreements about the kiddos? About the children? Jeez. So when you have these disagreements about the kids, right? So here's Zipporah and, and, and Moses. There's this big disagreement. They're both probably pretty strong individuals. Moses, we know, is, is a, a rockhead. Okay, Moses is a strong, you don't put, Moses was one of the guys you would not have pushed around, okay? Um, Zipporah, she was raised in, in, in elegance. She was raised as a priest, right, or a priestess. She was raised in a very royal household. She was respected in her community. So she probably had her nose up in the air, too. So you've got two very strong individuals coming at each other. So ends up, what ends up happening is Zipporah, to save his life, because at this point in time, Moses is probably not capable of doing the circumcision. Uh, he's probably gravely ill. To save his life, she takes a stone and she circumcises her son. And she is so angry about doing this that she takes the foreskin and throws it at the feet of Moses and yells at him. Right? So... Some people believe, now the reason I'm going to tell it to you this way is because it's not definitive. The Bible doesn't tell us. But some people believe that at that point in time that Moses sent her away. That this caused such a rift in their family that he said, you take you and the boys and you go back to daddy. Okay? Uh, other people believe that just after this meeting, Moses met with Aaron, his brother. And Aaron said, you've got a Midianite wife? What are you thinking? You're an Israelite. Why are you doing this, right? And so uh, Aaron counseled Moses to send her back. Other people thought what Eric mentioned earlier, which is she arrived at Egypt with Moses, but the danger was so great at some point in time with the plagues and everything that's happening in, in Egypt that Moses sent her home for her protection. So we don't know which of three, these three options it is. But she was sent home early, and it wasn't on great terms, probably. Okay? Now I'll go back to Exodus 
not Ephesians. 18. So it says, Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Moses' wife, Zipporah, after he had sent her away from Egypt. Verse 3 says, Along with her two sons. Notice it refers there to her two sons. Now it's going to change in verse 5. But in verse 3 it says, Along with her two sons. Of whom was named Gershom, stranger. And for Moses said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. And verse 4 says, The other son was named Eliezer. My God is my help. As Moses had said, for the God of my father was my help, and he rescued me from the sword of Pharaoh. Now, it's, it's significant that these two boys' names are brought out. Now, remember, in, in, in Bible naming, in, uh, especially in the Old Testament, these names carry great meaning. These names would be prayed about. There would be some leadership from the Lord. They would determine a name based upon whatever they thought the Lord's direction for that child was. Right down Proverbs 22 Six, I think. Um, I may be wrong about that reference. My brain's not working 100% at all. But that, that, that uh, train of a child, the way he should go when he's old, he'll not depart from it. That, that passage, it's Proverbs 22 something. But anyway, as, as, as they were planning or preparing this child's way, his path was laid out before him. Part of that path was his name. So, you know, uh, a, a carpenter would be called something close to the carpenter. Uh, um, uh, a wood, someone who worked with, uh, with steel or, or craftsmen or whatever type, they would be, uh, you know, following the family lineage, they would be named along that line. And if God gave them some, some special direction for that child, they would have that direction built into their name. So their name then became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Their name actually meant something. So Gershom, that meant I was a stranger in a foreign land, right? That's what Moses was when he was in Midian. Um, when you look at Eliezer, it meant God is my presence or God is my help, that God had helped him. So these two names having prominence is giving you a picture of Moses' life. Are you with me? Say, uh-huh. Uh -huh. All right, look at verse 5. Then Jethro, his father-in-law, again, you see his father-in-law, came with Moses' sons. Now it's Moses' sons all of a sudden. And his wife to join Moses in the wilderness where he was camped at the mountain of God, that is Mount Sinai and Horeb. Okay, so a quick question just, uh, just to kind of put this into context. How in the world would, first of all, uh, the priest, what's his name? Jethro. Jethro. How would Jethro hear all the things that were happening in Egypt? Sorry. Mark's like, you forgot the guy's name. <laughs> How would Jethro hear of all the things happening in Egypt with Israel? I mean, did word get around back then? I mean, they didn't have CNN, right? Spies. Say again. Spies. Well, they they, they had uh, they had people, they had uh, caravans, they had uh, um, 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 folks that were traders, merchants that were going up and down these trade routes. And so you can imagine if you were Mo, if you were um, Jethro, I'll get it right here in a second. If you were Jethro, you would be anxious to hear of anything happening with Moses and the Israelites, right? This is your son-in-law. So you'd be anxious to hear what was happening with him. And of course, Zipporah wants to know what's going on with her husband. So they'd be anxious for these reports that would come back from Egypt. So when they're hearing these majestic things, all the things that the Lord is doing, Egypt punishing Israel, God delivering Egypt, punishment, deliverance, punishment, miracle, right? So they would hear of all these things and must have been blown away by all that was happening. So that was my, my first question. How did they know? Second question, how did he know where Moses was going to be and that Moses would even meet him? Because, uh, you know, several months at least have, have passed, maybe a year has passed. So how, how would he know? The Amalekites is part of the, the, of the puzzle. They had just fought the Amalekites. How else would he know? Very insightful, Eric. That's exactly right. That's the last significant place where Moses was. This is the place of the burning bush. This is the place of the mountain of God, right? This is also the place where his father-in-law has had dispatched him early on in their relationship to guard the flocks. This mountain of God. So that's the second theory. A third theory is maybe it was prearranged. Maybe Moses sent word to Jethro 
I'm going to the mountain of God. I'll be there in a week or whatever you know the time frame was. Meet me there. Bring my family. That's a possibility as well. So they end up meeting up at this mountain of God. Now, look at verse 6. So you saw Jethro brings the family. Now Jethro meets Moses. Verse 6 says, He sent a message to Moses. I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and your two sons who are with her. Why did he send that message? just fought the Amalekites. So the, the Israelites at this point in time would be in full battle array, right? They would be in defensive mode. They would be, their, their, their radar would be sharply dialed in to see if there's anybody coming. So uh, uh, some group of Midianites, not Israelites, but a group of Midianites run, riding into the camp would have been a very dangerous thing. Okay, You would have had Israelite warriors coming down on you like thunder. So it probably would have been a mistake. Secondly, it would have been disrespectful. You know, for as far as their customs were concerned, Moses by this time was a great leader. Now this is early on in his uh, career as God's servant, but he was already respected as a great leader. So just to, to, just to say, hey, I'm having a meeting, I'm coming in, would have been disrespectful. You didn't even do that when you went to see the king, right? You would always send a, a, a servant or, or, or someone would go in to say, so-and-so is here to meet you. Will you see them? And they would say yes or no. So for, for, for those reasons, maybe for the reasons that, that we're not sure of how Moses sent his family back home. So maybe for those reasons, Eliezer said, or um, Jethro says, by the way, I've got your wife and kids. They're with you. But for whatever reason, he makes this, this formal announcement that they're coming. In verse 7 it says, so Moses went out to meet his father-in-law. Now look what Moses does. He does five things. Uh, just uh, jump down a letter or word for all these things. Number one, it says he went out to meet him. Okay, so that's a sign of respect. He goes out to meet him. Number two, he bowed down in respect. Now, part of the, the, the uh, Middle Eastern custom at the time, and, and still today for many, is to take your, your, your body and you bow your entire body down to the ground to where your forehead touches the ground. It's, it's a sign of respect. So you would bow all the way down to the ground. He does this to Jethro. Now remember, Moses is a great leader of an amazing uh, nation. So, you know what? God is growing into this fantastic nation. And Moses, as this great leader, bows down to the ground to Jethro. Look at the next thing that happens. He gets up from his feet, uh, and he kisses him. Now again, this is not unusual for Middle Eastern custom. In fact, it still happens today. Um, you know, that's why in the New Testament, Paul admonished folks to, to, to greet one another with a holy kiss. You know, it was a, it was a, it was a greeting back uh, in those days. So he, gets, he kisses him. Then the, the fourth thing you see is they asked about each other and their well-being. And then the fifth thing, they went into the tent. So you see this whole interaction happening. Now, you know, you, you, it may hit you, well, where is Zipporah in all this? Where's she at? So Moses and Jethro have this meeting, but there's no mention of his wife. I mean, wouldn't you think that they would want to have this big, happy reunion, the wife and Moses, and, you know, um, can you picture the scene, like the, the sun is setting the, against the ocean, and, and here's the husband running slowly in slow motion, and here's the wife running toward him, her veil, throwing it back in the wind, this very uh, melodramatic, you know, beauty. That didn't happen. Well, there was probably some kind of, of reunion, but it's not mentioned in text. It's not typically the style. Remember, this was a patriarchal society. Men ran this society. So women were mentioned far less uh, and, and took less roles of prominence, typically speaking, than the men did. So that's why she's not mentioned. Then look at verse uh, 8. It says, Moses told her father-in-law about all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh, number one, <coughs> and the Egyptians for Israel's sake, and about number two, all the hardship that had happened during the journey 
And number three, how the Lord had rescued them. Okay? So Moses sits down with Jethro, tells him all these things that have happened, and then here's Jethro's response. Look at verse 9. It says, Jethro rejoiced over all the good things that the Lord had done to Israel, number one, and that he had rescued them from the hand of the Egyptians. Then we go into Jethro praising Yahweh. Look at verse 10. Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord, number two, who has rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of Pharaoh, and who has, number three, rescued the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. So here's what happened. Moses mentions three different things. And in, in, in his prayer response, Jethro comes back with three responses in his prayer as a praise to Yahweh. So picture this. You've got this Midianite priest, someone who's not educated in, in uh, monotheism or one God. He's not educated in Yahweh. He's heard of Yahweh. In fact, he's a little impressed with Yahweh because he's heard about all these amazing things that Yahweh's done to Egypt. But he's not familiar with their customs. So here you've got the number one prophet of Israel. Imagine this. The number one prophet of Israel, you've got this Midianite priest that comes into his presence and begins leading worship. Pretty impressive, isn't it? Now, prior to this time, I don't believe that Jethro is a believer. Now, that's between Jethro and God, right? Only them two know. But it doesn't appear that he was a believer. It appears that he was a pagan. He was very religious, but not a believer in Yahweh. So at some point in time, through this process of Moses sharing all the amazing things that God had done, this priest, this pagan priest, is going to be converted. You see this happening before your eyes. Look at verse 10. Again, he says, He rescued the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. In verse 11, Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods. So he's saying, Now I know He's greater than all the gods. All what gods? All the, all the ones he had professed. But what, what gods in particular do you think he would be dialed into? The Egyptian, the Egyptian gods. Right? Because he had seen all, and heard about all these Egyptian gods. So he's thinking all these Egyptian gods come up and here's this one god, Yahweh. This singular god. It was weird because they, 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 they worshipped a pantheon. Right? They worshipped all these gods in unison. The sun god and the moon god and and, and, and the, the Nile, and, you know, all these different things that they worship, most of which were related to, to, to nature or things. But then there's this one God that comes on the scene and wipes them all out, defeats them all. So he's pretty impressed by it. But then he says, now I know that the Lord is greater. Now that word Lord, how is that written in your Bible? All caps. Do you know why it's in all caps? You know what that means when you see L-O-R-D in all caps? Versus L-O-R-D, not in all caps? Or G-O-D? Yeah. Jer Jermosh. Uh, Jehovah. Uh, us, uh, Yahweh. So, he's speaking of Yahweh. Now, the difference between Yahweh and the other God he refers to, G-O-D, which is Elohim, the difference between those two is Elohim is a plurality of God that's somewhat distant. Yahweh is a personal God that's very, very close. That's the difference between the two. That's how in Genesis it goes from Elohim to Yahweh. There's a transition that happens in the first couple of chapters of Genesis. He becomes this, this far away, uh, distant, massive God to this very close, personal God. This seems to indicate that this is the point that Jethro's heart is regenerated. That he sees God as a personal God. He is my God. So you see this amazing event that takes place, probably surrounding some uh, family conflict. So take heart. If there's conflict in your family, great things can come from it. Okay, let's finish up. He says, Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods indeed, was proven when they acted so insolently toward Israel, and the Lord showed himself infinitely superior to all their gods. Verse 12. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, in case we forgot, took a burnt offering and other sacrifices to offer to God, and Aaron came with all the elders of Israel and eat a meal to eat a meal with Moses, Moses' father-in-law before God. So this is Jethro praising Yahweh. Now, what's
what they do is they come together after this praise meeting that, that this Midianite priest leads in the presence of an Israelite prophet, the greatest prophet of all time. So they, after this time of praise, they enter into this time of, of worship. Okay, so what they're doing here, Mark, is they bring food. It's a good key to worship. They bring food. And, and the food that they bring, now if you see in your notes on your horizon, I wrote down two words for you. One was Olah and one was Zebahim. Uh, Olah means a burnt offering. A burnt offering is something that, that, that's given and the entire offering is consumed, is burned up to God. That's, that's Olah. Okay? This is not that word. This is Zebahim. That word means part of it is burnt up, the rest of it is divided up for the people to eat. So it was a time of worship. The first one is more severe and is, and, and is not dealing with any kind of fellowship with God because they're afraid of God to a degree. That burnt offering is supposed to be a, a buffer between them and God. The second one, the one that we see here, Zabahim, that one is something that's given as, as an act of worship to God and recognition of who He is, but also fellowship of the people. Also bringing people together to fellowship around Him. So the closest thing to what we do today is Zabahim. You know, we have some kind of offering that we raise up to God in our praise or in our sacrifice and our love and our devotion. We raise these things, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. We raise up our bodies as living sacrifices to God. Now, that sweet aroma that, that, that He receives from, from the, the, the sacrifice of living our lives for Him. And then we spend that time in communion. We spend time getting closer to one another. By the way, um, we change things up a little bit today. 31 minutes. Woo! We change things up a little bit today. We're going to finish here shortly. Our corporate family worship time. When we're finished with our family worship time, we encourage you that you can hang out as long as you want to and talk, share prayer requests, get to know people. If there's folks here that you don't recognize, spend time getting to know them. So before you rush out the door, Meet some people. Say hi. Get closer. Uh, talk to folks about them. Not about you. Always be others minded. The more that you do that, because they're rarely going to get that when they leave these walls. Once they leave here, most people during most of their week is going to want to talk about themselves. Not talk about others. Why not? So they all come together with God, with Aaron, uh, all the elders of Israel, they come with Moses, follow them on, they have this meal. So, Moses brings all these people together. Actually, Jethro brings all these people together for this amazing meeting. And at this, at this meeting, um, Moses is present, although he's not mentioned, he's assumed. Moses is present, present. Jethro is present. Aaron, Moses' brother, is present. The, the, he is the official priest of Israel. And then the elders are present. So all these people come together for this meeting. Now what's amazing about this is this is the first ever um, multi-denominational gathering. Right? Because you've got this, this Midianite that, that worships these other gods coming together with these Israelites that worship only one God, that worship Yahweh. So you've got them coming together, and the amazing thing is they come up together under the banner of Yahweh. In other words, when they saw the majesty of Yahweh, their differences kind of burned up. Their, their borders kind of disappeared. The distinctions went away. And so I'm thinking, what, what, how informative is this for us? I mean, how amazing. Because Skypoint's strength has always been that we focus, or we attempt to invest in our, to our human ability, to focus on the main thing. Not, not all these tangential issues that could be divisive and, 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 and cultivate fractures and splits and all these other things. But we focus on the majesty of Jesus Christ. And see, if other people from other denominations or wherever, that's why there's so many different ones represented here today. There's everything here today. I know you. You guys have shared with me, so I know all your backgrounds. And there's a variety of backgrounds, some that would really surprise you. But, but all these different backgrounds can be brought together under the umbrella of the beauty and the majesty, the glory of Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful, a beautiful thing. It's an instructive thing for us. Okay, let's pray.